Hello, hello everyone. Alyssa Lebrecht, nutritionist and gut expert here. And last week we were talking all about SIBO and figuring out how the heck do you know if you've got it? So many of our friends, gut lovers hanging out in our free Facebook group, the Love Your Guts IBS support group, are often posting questions about their symptoms that are happening. And I was seeing this real common um, pattern happening that many, 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 many people were getting incredible, incredible amounts of bloating. And so this past week, we did a free training for our clients in that uh, free Facebook group, all on understanding the difference between bloating. And what was most amazing was how many people identified with the symptoms of SIBO. And so we last week dove into to figuring out how you have it, but this week I really want to talk about the six things that will cause SIBO. So, some of you uh, have reached out over the last week as we've been we've been digging into SIBO more and more, and many of you have been concerned about well there's two camps. One, I've got SIBO and I've tried so many things. I've been on numerous rounds of antibiotics and nothing seems to be working. What do I do? Okay, so there's many of those types of people. And then there's another group of people that have been reaching out to me who have been really concerned, being like, Alyssa, I don't know if I have SIBO, but I know I don't want it. What do I need to do to fix my gut to prevent myself from developing SIBO? So whether you are in either, either camp here, tonight is gonna to be really, really important for you to watch right through to the end, okay? Because the reality is, is that if you have gut issues, you are at risk of developing SIBO, all right? Because the same damage and deficiencies that create general IBS, gas bloating, diarrhea, constipation can snowball into small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so what we do inside the Love and Trust Your Guts program is put all of our clients through a made gut repair system so that we address all of the damage and deficiencies that got them stuck in the first place. And that's really what helps them to prevent the reoccurrence of their gut issues but also any further progression of, of any sort of condition okay and this also stands for those in the SIBO department it's really important that you're given a maintenance plan and so many people out there I'm seeing they're being given antibiotics and sent home and there's no actual plan or they're given a bunch of herbal antimicrobials same thing no follow-up plan no follow-up plan, they're not fixing the reason why SIBO came in the first place, and they're not teaching you how to maintain your results, and so SIBO keeps coming back, right? How many of you guys have been in this boat? If you're watching this, and you've been fighting Candida, and you've been, or not Candida, SIBO, you've been fighting SIBO, and you've done all these darn things, and nothing seems to be working, and you get a little bit of progress, but all your symptoms are still hanging out, please let me know in the comments. All right, let me know, drop it, drop it in the comments. We're gonna get you some support, all right? So tonight, let's talk about the six things that will cause SIBO. The one thing I really wanna run home is that there's not just one thing that causes SIBO. It's likely gonna be a little bit of all of the above, okay? Or you're gonna be checking off several of these uh, six things tonight, and uh, it's really important that you address all of the things that are affecting your gut, because if you miss even just one thing, that can be the thing that keeps you stuck. The number one thing that I see people getting stuck on is that they're missing critical pieces of the puzzle. So please, please don't think that you just need to eat healthy or follow the low FODMAP diet. You, you can't just take a random probiotic or go buy a random bottle of enzymes and hope that this is going to pass. Okay? It doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, you're, you're beyond that now, okay? We're dealing with serious damage and deficiencies in the gut, and so it is absolutely possible for you to feel normal again, and in order to do that, we gotta fill in all those missing pieces, okay? So the first thing that we're gonna talk about that really, really sets your gut up for the angry gut train is stress. I know. I know, you're like, really? We're gonna talk about stress again? <laughs> Everyone hates talking about stress because we know we need to be dealing with it and we're struggling to manage it, right? 
whether you're going through stress right now or not, we've all been through periods of stress in our life. And you might even be watching this being like, that's not me, Alyssa. I'm cool as a cucumber. And the thing is, is that you might be cool as a cucumber, but then I'd ask you, do you have a busy mind? Okay, so if you have a busy mind, that's also also really stressful for the body. Now, I like to give you guys a little bit more of an understanding of why I'm sharing these things with you because it's, I don't think, helpful just to be like, oh, it's stress, right? When I was trying to fix my gut, what was so frustrating was no one was taking the time to explain why it was happening to me and why I needed to make that change so that I could really get on board. And the thing about stress is that it shuts down your gut. It, it turns off your digestive system. Think of it like a light switch. It's like, boop, just turns off that light switch, turns off the gut, okay? Rest and digest, shuts that baby right off. And instead turns the light switch on, boop, to fight or flight. Okay, so your body switches into fight or flight mode. So if you're stressed out or you have a busy mind and it could be like you got in a fight with your spouse or your coworker is pissing you off or your kids are driving you nuts or maybe you are sitting at home and you are spinning your wheels, you're constantly stressing, worrying about your gut, wondering what you need to do, whether your gut's going to cooperate, if when you eat you're going to have a reaction, if you're friends and co-workers are going to notice that you look like you are seven months pregnant, even though you're not. If you're constantly Googling, trying to find answers, right? If you are constantly spinning, worrying, stressing, wondering, dwelling in all the pain of your gut, your, your body, unfortunately, is not able to decipher the difference of if you have an actual psychopath chasing after you, or if you are just wondering if your gut's going to cooperate today, okay? Or if you had a bad day at work. It can't tell the difference. And so again, guys, it turns off rest and digest and it puts you into fight or flight because your body thinks that you have a psychopath or a bear chasing after you or a Mack truck coming through your window. And so then the problem is, is we go to sit down and eat lunch. And your digestive system isn't turned on because you're in fight or flight. Your body's ready to run away. Okay, so stress is so, so tough on the gut. And what we've seen through studies is that it depletes some really important things in your gut, specifically good bacteria and enzymes. All right, and we're going to start to kind of unpack this as we go through. So stress, no bueno. It is definitely going to create the conditions, damage and deficiencies within your gut that will allow SIBO to come in and take over because it's breaking down your defense system, which is your good bacteria and your enzymes. Okay, now let's talk about the second thing. This one is probably going to be surprising for a lot of people, but having elevated levels of estrogen can put you at risk of SIBO. And it's interesting because when we are struggling with hormone issues, it's usually because of a gut imbalance. And so when gut, in, gut issues or gut imbalances are prolonged, we start to develop hormone imbalances. And as estrogen elevates and that, that hormone imbalance becomes even greater, then this also snowballs with the other digestive imbalances that put you at risk of having SIBO. Okay, and so what's interesting my dad was just giving me a, a quick little call there. We'll have to give him a call back. Do you know what? It's been a really busy week, and I think my dad's called me every day this week so far, and I have not called him back because I'm just so dang busy fixing guts. <laughs> so, dad, I'll call you back in a hot second. Um, all right, so here's the thing about elevated estrogen is that what we've seen is it actually delays gastric emptying. Mm, what the hell does that mean, Alyssa? So in other words, your bowels are not going to eliminate properly. You're probably erring on the side of constipation. Okay. And what, what's also interesting is elevated levels of estrogen are what can create tissue growth in the body. And this is where we start to see uh, things like endometriosis. And so there is a correlation between endometriosis and SIBO. Okay, the other thing about elevated levels of estrogen is it inhibits the release of bile, which is an enzyme that helps to break down fat, but it also is antimicrobial. And so if we're hindering 
uh, your, your liver's ability to produce the bile, for it to be stored in the gallbladder, we're now affecting digestion, but we're also weakening your body's defense system from keeping bad bacteria out in the intestines. Okay, so we need to also be mindful of your hormones. And we see often that there's hormone imbalances, especially when SIBO is present. Now, let's talk about the third thing. So I briefly touched on this when we were chatting about number one, you know, stress, one of the things about stress is that it depletes your good bacteria and your enzymes. So the third thing I wanna to talk to you about is having an underactive stomach. And what we've seen is when this stress starts to snowball and you start to become depleted in enzymes, especially hydrochloric acid, when you have chronically low hydrochloric acid, this acid enzyme is designed to keep buggers out, right? Keep the bad bacteria out. It's your defense system because they can't thrive in an acidic environment. So when that acid becomes depleted and what is incredibly common is, you know, years ago it might have started for you as a little bit of gas and bloating, maybe poops were a bit wonky, and then you started to develop maybe a little bit of acid reflux and the doctors were hot to trot on putting you on some sort of proton pump inhibitor or antacids without testing your stomach acid levels. Okay, and what we come to find when we test our clients is that no, they actually have very low stomach acid levels and they're taking these proton pump inhibitors, right? And so it's worsening the problem. And so your defense system is really low when you're not able to keep bad bacteria out because your acid is not where it should be. Stomach acid, okay, to be clear. So the other thing with the stomach acid is it's meant to break down your foods, right? It helps to break down your foods, especially protein. And so this is also why it's really common to be experiencing gas and bloating with SIBO and other digestive issues because you're not breaking your foods down properly, okay? Now, before you sprint out and go buy some random enzyme from the health food store, I really, really encourage you to stop wasting your money on buying random shit and just throwing it to the wall and hoping it'll stick. You must be tested. You need to test these things so that you understand which enzymes you need and what dosage you need and for how long you need to be taking that. And so again, guys, part of the problem is that people are getting stuck because they're trying to guess their way through this and sort of Googling their way through that is is really not going to be fruitful because what ends up happening is you miss in, you miss important pieces of the puzzle, okay? Or you're getting close, but you're, you're, you're off the mark because you don't know, again, how much enzyme, what dosage, what specific um, enzymes you need. And then we are going to talk about this with probiotics too, you know, knowing what strains you need, what dosage, okay? And so, guys, please, please stop guessing because all, all that happens is when you try that and then it doesn't work, you get so frustrated and hopeless thinking that it's not possible for you. And it's not that it's not possible, it's just that you've tried everything but actually fixing your gut and with much love, you just don't know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> so I don't want you to start to lose the faith because of that. So let's get you on a proper system here, okay? So underactive stomach is so incredibly common when it comes to SIBO. And this is also part of the problem. There's a bit of a pecking order when it comes to addressing SIBO and those bacteria will prevent you from replenishing certain uh, enzymes and bacteria. And so you need to make sure that you're doing it in the proper order so that you're actually getting the upper hand on the bacteria. Again, otherwise it's gonna come right back. Um, so sorry, Lee, I'm just seeing your question here. Am I saying that stress can cause SIBO? I'm saying stress can cause damage and deficiencies in your gut that put you at, re at risk of getting SIBO, yes. All right, so let's talk about the number four. Number four. And number four is similar to number three. It is an imbalance in your microbiome, your good bacteria, okay, not having enough good bacteria. Uh, now, I talk about stress being one of the things that can deplete your enzymes and your good bacteria, but there's many, many other things that we're exposed to on a day-to-day -day basis that can deplete you, okay? That can look like age, 
<laughs> right? Aging. As we get older, we just naturally are depleted. It's just like your car going through wear and tear, right? Your gut it's getting worn out here. So age, environmental toxins, if you're eating the same foods all the time, uh, what else? Not enough water, too much coffee, not getting good quality sleep, antibiotic use. So there's a lot of different things that will naturally deplete your good bacteria and your enzymes along with stress, okay? But let's talk about number four, not having enough good bacteria. These guys are like bouncers at the door keeping bad bacteria out. And so again, what commonly happens is that people know that probiotics are helpful for the gut. So they run out and they're like, let's do it. I did this too. When I was trying to fix my gut, I ran to the health food store and I bought the most expensive probiotic and I'm like, this is going to do it. I feel it in my bones. <laughs> and I brought it home, tried it and it did nothing. <laughs> and here's the thing guys, is that uh, it's because I was still missing a lot of the other pieces that probiotics alone are not gonna fix your gut. But I also just wanna give you guys a heads up that if you do have SIBO, it's really common for you to feel worse when you take a probiotic. So that's another sign that there may be SIBO present. Um, there are specific strains of bacteria that you need to be taking if you have SIBO, and there are many strains of bacteria that you need to stay away from while you're getting rid of the bacteria. And as you get rid of the bacteria and get your gut stronger, you can start to branch out and uh, taste the rainbow, as I say, experience more strains of bacteria, more variety. But in this period of addressing SIBO, in most cases, probiotics are a no-go, all right? Now, that's not to say probiotics are not good. It's not to say that you don't need them. It's that you need to understand what strains are not going to worsen the SIBO and react with the SIBO, okay? Now, this is a, it's a tricky sort of catch-22 because you need those good bacteria to keep bad bacteria out. But think of it this way, at this point, your bad bacteria, they've got the upper hand. And so we have to weaken the bad bacteria and increase the good bacteria. Weaken the bad bacteria, increase the good bacteria. Same thing, we keep repeating this process so that eventually the good bacteria get the upper hand. So these little buggers, I want you to think about the good bacteria as kind of like you're, um, if you're ever to go to a fancy nightclub, okay, aka the bar. <laughs> If you ever go to the bar, which I'm, I'm sure you're not going to the bar because you've got terrible gut issues and you're like, Alyssa, I can't even eat food, let alone touch alcohol. <laughs> but if you were to go to a bar, you would notice that they've got bouncers at the door keeping the assholes out, okay? Now, if those bouncers decided to just go on a bit of a break or a vacay and all of a sudden these bad bacteria start coming into the bar and they're taking over and, you know, they start bringing their friends and, and then all of a sudden the bar is full of all of these bad people, these bad bacteria. Okay, so now you can just go and tell those good bacteria, aka the bouncers, to get back to the front door, but your bar is already full of bad bacteria, bad people. So we got to kick the assholes out, right? We got to get rid of the bad bacteria first, and then we put the bouncers back at the front door. Does this make sense? Okay, so again, this is what I mean, guys. There's a bit of a pecking order. So a lot of people, they're quick to go out and buy a probiotic, but all you're doing is just putting good bacteria in there, and then you've got a whole whole big club full of bad bacteria, and it's like World War I happening in your gut. Who feels me here? Who here has taken a probiotic and felt like a bag of poop after? Right, made you bloat more, made you gassy, or just did nothing at all, right? So again, probiotics are essential, but there's a time and a place for probiotics, especially when it comes to SIBO. All right, let's talk about the next one. Number five, number five and six are kind of similar but different. All right, so number five, let's talk about slow transit time. Okay, this is where you know a lot of people have been doing. If you're if you're curious about the SIBO world, and you've been googling. Mm -hmm. You've been searching the World Wide Web and you're trying to find a solution and I'll, I'll almost guarantee that you've run into a, a number of blogs talking about the migratory motor complex, right? The MMC and how that's the thing that you need to fix to fix your SIBO, right? And so here's the thing is that slow 
transit time, you know, fancy words for just motility issues. Okay, you're not pooping enough, you're constipated, and your bowels are not contracting properly. Now, whether you refer to it MMC, motility issues, constipation, slow transit, whatever you want, it's all the same thing, okay? But slow transit time, so that peristalsis of the colon is not working properly. And what happens when this occurs is, if you can imagine, we need that to happen to push out toxins, bacteria, waste, through the intestines and out the back chute, all right? Now, if, if you are not moving this out fast enough, okay? If things are moving too slow, then bacteria can start to get trapped in the small intestine. And then they start to overpopulate and overgrow, and that's what we call SIBO, guys, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so slow motility is definitely one of the things that will cause SIBO, right? Now, here's where a lot of people get stuck, is they think that they just have to take some sort of motility supplement, right? But it's so much bigger than that because we have to fix the reason why you have slow motility in the first place because what will happen is the SIBO either won't go away at all or if you do manage to reduce your uh, hydrogen levels or your methane levels of gas in the intestines, it will come back because you didn't fix the reason why the motility issues occurred in the first place. Make sense? So motility issues are incredibly important. And if you have SIBO, you will need to continue to support motility likely the rest of your life. Okay, so motility issues can be caused from many, many things like not enough good bacteria, chronically low stomach acid. This is where we start talking about there's several things here. But also there can be structural damage, nerve damage, adhesions, inflammation, and things that have happened to the intestines that will create slow motility or migratory, migratory motor complex issues, okay? I mean, guys, the whole gut health world, people are making things too complicated. Let's just call it like it is. You're not pooping. You're not pooping fast enough, okay? So you need to get pooping more and you need to keep pooping. And that's really important to keep SIBO away, to keep these bacteria from overpopulating. Um, now I'm really, really downplaying it, keeping it simple, but again, I think that we need to make it accessible so you guys really understand and get a good visual. So again, if bacteria are not moving through, if they're getting trapped in the small intestine because things are too slow, that's a problem. Now, number six, <laughs> I hope you guys didn't just hear that. Eric just, Sorry. <laughs> he's swearing in the background, but I have a potty mouth too, probably more than Eric. Uh, that, my dad, actually, he's probably calling me to tell me to stop swearing like a trucker. <laughs> so that's what he always tells me. You sound like a goddamn trucker, Alyssa. And I said, well, that's where I got it from, dad. <laughs> Anyways, guys, let's talk about number six. Um, number six is fast transit time. So if you have too fast of a transit time, again, fancy term, if you've got diarrhea, if you can't stop pooping, if, if stuff is shooting through the tube way too fast, right? And these are some symptoms to be aware of if you have like chronic constipation or chronic diarrhea, and nothing seems to be working. You're trying all of the things. You're doing the anti-diarrheals, the laxatives, and, and they're not responding. Or you go from, it's especially, I'll give you an example. We have a client of ours we're working with right now. When she first started with us, she was sharing with me that she has terrible diarrhea. And she was pooping about eight to ten times per day and straight water. And what was happening was she would take a bunch of Imodium and medications her doctors were giving her to try to slow down her bowels. And then what would happen is she'd be so bunged up, she wouldn't poop at all for a day. And then the next day, she'd shit her pants. Like, it was a really terrible, terrible situation of this up and down roller coaster, right? No one was addressing the bacteria. And so she's only one week into her SIBO protocol. One week, guys, and she's gone from raging diarrhea to stabilized, formed, balanced poops. She's getting four perfect poops every single day. That's 
incredible. We have another client who uh, we've been working together for quite some time. When she first started with us, she was having to wear Depends to work. Same thing, 10 to 15 bowel movements per day, having accidents, which is why she was wearing Depends to work. She wouldn't leave the house without them. We got her tested for SIBO. Turns out that she was hydrogen dominant. We put her on a responsive removal plan Within just one and a half weeks, she went from 10 to 15 poops per day to two poops per day. So guys, this is why I always say it's absolutely possible for you to feel normal again, but if you're missing critical pieces of the puzzle, you will remain stuck, okay? So don't lose the faith. So in these cases of severe diarrhea, What's happening is, you know, I keep it really simple again. Think of your intestines like a tube and stuff is just shooting right through the middle. And so if you're just shooting right through the middle, you're not properly bulking and forming the stool and everything that's gone caked up on the intestinal walls. Right? And so you're not properly forming a stool and much like constipation, what we find is that bacteria can again continue to get stuck in the small intestine and they start to overpopulate and cause problems. Okay, so too slow motility is also uh, something that you need to really, really be, or sorry, too fast of motility is something you also need to be really, really mindful of when it comes to SIBO. So, um, I want to just hit on one more qu quick thing here that's really, really incredibly important, and that is getting rid of SIBO, okay? So uh, we briefly touched on this last week. Last week we went live and we talked about how do you know if you have SIBO, so if you didn't catch that last week, uh, you can catch the replay on our Facebook page in the video tab, or you can also jump over to YouTube. We've got tons of videos over there. Uh, Alyssa Labrack, gut expert, and you can subscribe and you'll catch the replay and every time we post videos you'll get notified. Um, so go check that out and we teach you how to figure out if you've got SIBO. But if let's say you've got SIBO or you suspect you have it and um, maybe even you've been through all sorts of rigmarole trying to get rid of it. And the number one mistake that people are making when they're trying to address their SIBO is that they're either given antibiotics, let's unpack this. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail here. What are we doing for time? I don't even know what time it is. Um, how are we doing here? Okay, I pretty much gotta go, but I'm gonna spend the time anyway. So here's the number one mistake people are making is uh, a lot of the times they go to their doctor and their doctor's like antibiotics. Um, and it, the thing about antibiotics, guys, is that sometimes they're absolutely necessary, all right? In the case of SIBO, what we've seen through studies is that Zyfaxin, also known as Rifaximin, only has a 60% success rate. That's not fantastic, okay? Because the other problem with that is that there's a 90% reoccurrence rate. 90%, meaning it's coming back and it always comes back worse. So even if you manage to eliminate some of the symptoms short term, if you're lucky, because most people don't end up feeling great on the antibiotic or it does nothing for them, um, even if you do manage to be somewhat successful with the antibiotic, it doesn't fix the reason why SIBO came in the first place. And so it absolutely will come back, okay? and that's really, really important for you to know because whether you decide to do antibiotics or not, it's all good. But you're going to need some sort of responsive gut repair system to fix the reason why it came. Again, otherwise it's gonna come back. So the other common mistake is that people will either Google or they go to practitioners who don't totally understand SIBO. They're not specialists in the area. And so they end up being given or they're Googling random supplements, antimicrobials. And again, they weed, 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 weed. They try to kick out all these bacteria and they don't fix the reason why it came in the first place. So here's the problem, guys, is you can't just kick out SIBO. You can't just take a bunch of antimicrobials or antibiotics and weed out the bacteria because all you're doing is lowering the level of bacteria, if you're lucky. 
but we still have to get the gut stronger, replenish the, if you listen, if you still have not enough uh, enzymes happening, if you're underactive, if you have not enough good bacteria and overgrowth of bad bacteria, things like leaky gut, motility damage, you're gonna be stuck, okay? Now I know that sounds harsh, but I don't want you guys getting frustrated when, when one thing doesn't work for you. Okay, I, I talk to far too many people that get so frustrated and they lose the faith and they tell me that this is just normal for them. It's not normal, guys. It's not normal. So the big mistake is don't just take a bunch of random things to try to kill the SIBO because if you do that, you're eventually going to just deplete your body. And we've had clients that come into the program that have been self-navigating, self -navigating. they've been taking all these antimicrobials on their own for years and years to the point where they've done further damage to their gut. So it's incredibly important that you weed, replenish, weed, replenish, weed, replenish. That's the process for tackling SIBO. Okay, so if you're watching this right now and you've either been through it all with SIBO, you're still struggling with it, you've been diagnosed, you've not been properly treated, if you suspect you have SIBO and you don't know where to start, I want you to drop a buy SIBO in the comments, okay? Drop buy SIBO in the comments and tomorrow I'm going to send you a personal message and I want to jump into private messenger because we're going to talk through some personal questions, I'm going to talk about your poop. All right, we're gonna talk through all your symptoms and I wanna get sorted through what the hell's missing here, okay? Because if you're watching this right now, you're stuck, right? If you're watching this right now, then you're not feeling normal and you need some support. And so I'm gonna help you sort through, we're gonna talk about the things that you've tried and we're gonna figure out what is missing. Okay, so drop that in the comments, bye SIBO. Yeah, Lee's like, bye SIBO. Right? Kind of like, bye Felicia. Say bye to SIBO. Okay? It, it is possible. And please, for the love of, love of God, stop Googling. Stop Googling, like, about SIBO and reading all the, all the random people who don't know what the hell that, they don't know what the hell they're doing. And so they're telling you that it's not possible to get rid of SIBO and how it never worked. And, like, stop reading those stories that of people who have been unsuccessful because they don't know what they're doing okay it's absolutely possible it's absolutely possible so drop by SIBO in the comments I'm gonna reach out tomorrow we'll send you a PM um, and in the meantime though I gotta go guys we got a client call tonight and I gotta have dinner still so I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of your night I hope this was helpful and we'll be back next week bye guys